Yeah, no problem, Jer. Um, everything's good. Just trying to figure out this uh, virtual world and being away from the players. It's been a challenge for really all of us, uh, from the staff to the coaches, obviously our student athletes, um, you know, just not seeing them on a, on a day-to-day basis and being able to communicate at will, um, just making sure their families are okay and our families are good. And um, it's been the most challenging thing I've done in my career, no doubt. So, Wow. Well, thank you. All righty, we're going to go ahead and open it up, uh, open the floor up for questions. We're going to open it up with a question from Dave Biddle from 24-7 Sports with Tony Gerdman on deck. Dave? Thanks, Jerry, and thank you for your time, Mick. Mick, you touched on this already. Can you elaborate, though, on how challenging this time period is for you personally in terms of getting your players ready for the season? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's almost like – I don't want to use this analogy, but I am because – it's like if you were a, I mean, it's it's kind of like if you're a, you know, in charge of people, but you can't actually be in charge of people. Does that, that make sense? Um, it's just so hard because, um, you know, we may have a message of 30, you know, 30 players training at one time and it's easy. You give them a message and, they get it. They know what's going on for the next day. They move on. And then here comes the next 30 and then you're done. Now it's 30 separate different messages and 30 separate different calls and 30 separate different emails and texts. And it's just, it's no doubt twice as busy as if we were still in the Woody. Um, so it's kind of, it's like at the end of the day, you're complete, not that you weren't exhausted before because you always are, but, it's just like you're completely spent from another, almost like a different, you know, different way. And just a quick follow-up, how concerned are you that some of the guys on the team are falling behind a little bit right now from a strength and conditioning perspective? Um, I think it's a concern every day I go to bed. You know, just when you lay in bed, you're just like, God, I hope everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And the good thing is, is we've got some great leadership um, and – you know, the message that I've given to the players on our Zoom meetings and uh, with our staff is, is this, like, you know, when this thing's over, it, hopefully soon, whenever it, whenever it does, you know, get back to some sort of normality, like you're either better or you're worse than you were when this thing started. So I put a challenge out to our team, our coaches, our staff, everybody, like you're, you're either better or you're worse. And it's, you can't make an excuse about the circumstance that we all – have to deal with um it's you know there's other people out there that that, you know our our competitors you know our um teams we're going to play like are they working harder than you are like i know you don't have equipment i know you don't have weights i know i I get it i know it's raining outside i know i know i know i know like but at some point this thing's going to be over and we've got to be again you're either better or worse so we've we've pretty much um have uh led that message and just make sure our leaders are permeating throughout the team when they talk to each other. Thanks, Mick. I appreciate it. Next up, Tony Gerdman from the Ozone with Nathan Baird on deck. Tony? Hey, hey, Mick. Thanks for doing this. When we talked to Ryan Day a while back, he said he wasn't going to make everybody wear watches and do stuff like that. But I do wonder what kind of monitoring is going on? What kind of reporting do the players do to do um, give to you guys? And then, it's what do you do with that to make sure everybody is trying to be better when they get back? Yeah, great question. You know, the NCAA has some guidelines on us that this time period is, at least for physical activity, is voluntary. So they can't really, um, by NCAA rules, report objectively back to us. Now, yeah. they can, you know, we do uh, contact them and they do report back how they're doing just from a wellness and a safety standpoint. Um, uh, you know, nutritional standpoint and things that we're permitted to do. So it, it's it's really hard. You know, we can't um, we can't um, you know we can't mandate that they do this training. They can't video things and send it back to us. Um, we can't virtually train. Meaning, like you know, we have a Zoom call and there's like a you know a group of eight and we're watching them train. You can't do that. So 
Yeah, a lot of it is, you know, doing it when nobody else is watching. Now, the one cool thing um, that we were able to implement is a, is a strength and conditioning app that goes on their phone. So we're able to write workouts based on what equipment they have available, whether they have access to a full gym, like a lot of guys actually have weight rooms in their, you know, garages, and some guys have limited dumbbells and some barbells and some stuff. And then we've also had the uh, ability to send them bands um, so they could do a band workout, body weight workout, some um, unique things to use with backpacks and things like that. But they follow this app and, uh, you know, Monday, Wednesday, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday through Friday, whatever it is. And it's easy for them because they're on their phones all the time and they just go down through it and they can kind of keep track um, of what they're doing. And we can kind of uh, prescribe workouts based on what they have and what they've, what they've been doing. I wonder you've had a lot of teams. I'm not asking you to name names or anything like that, but how well equipped was this team to handle this? And have there been other teams that were maybe worse or, or better equipped? Great question. Um, I'm taking it the question is equipped from the standpoint of the mentality of the team. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So, again, I think uh, if you look at our roster, we have a lot of guys that play a lot of football. And I think the team from last year uh, and the leadership that we had just kind of, you know, kind of carried over. I think it's a um, – Coach Day calls it a test. You know, it's a test every day of who we are. I think it's a test um, of our program's culture, of our strength and conditioning program's culture. Um, I think it's a test of um, what our team is and how accountable they are, they are to each other. Um, I look at it from a little different – uh, aspect. I look at it as an opportunity for growth uh, because anytime there's some, some adversity that, that hits your life or hits your world, you know, again, like to me, it's it's opportunity for growth. So if you look at our, you know, I feel pretty good about the three linebackers that are, that are leading that group. You know, you got Justin Hilliard and Pete Warner and Tough Borland. They've been around, they've been around a long time. So I'm hoping that when they get in their meetings and their linebacker meetings and those guys are really being vocal um, and making sure guys are doing what they're supposed to do so when we come back, we're in pretty good shape. So if you look at all our positions, you know, we have, we have some really good leadership there and some guys that have played and, you know, hopefully they're they're uh, relaying those messages of you better be doing your, your uh, you know, all the things you got to do so when we get back, we're ready to roll. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Next up, Nathan Baird from Cleveland.com with Dennis Dodd on deck. Nathan? All right, we're going to move on to uh, Dennis Dodd from CBS Interactive with Kevin Noon on deck. Dennis? Oh, this is a first. <laughs> Next up, Kevin Noon, Rivals.com, Buckeye Grove with Mitch Stacy on deck. Kevin? Hey, Kevin, that's not that's not understandable. I don't know if you what's going on there. I couldn't. Yeah, that's not that's not working. Um, Yeah, that's yeah. We 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 can't understand you. You sound like um, <laughs> ET or something like that. <laughs> Kev, you want to try to call back in and 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 I'll call back on you. And then uh, now we'll go to Mitch Stacy from Associated Press with Bill Rabinowitz on deck. Okay, by attrition. Cool. Uh, good morning, Mick. Uh, good morning. So many players. So many players. Have- develop and reach their potential in that, um, you know, that final year of college football. Some of them put themselves in the position to be a high draft pick and, you know, just everything comes together in that one year. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on what happens with this season, we don't know what that is yet. How concerned are you that some players are going to miss out on that chance and, uh, you know, really do anything yeah. about it? Yeah, I think it's um... – Again, I think the circumstance speaks for itself, so you really can't do anything about that. But I, I think everybody's concerned just because, you know, you you missed 
fall practices of spring football. You missed, you know, now you're getting into, you know, summer training just week by week um, getting diminished. We don't know. We have no idea what the future holds. We have no idea what the season looks like. Um, I think, uh, but I do think uh, that is concerning, but I do think that players can get better uh, on their own or wherever they're at um, based on also just, you know, maybe sitting back and, you know, learning the game a little bit better. Uh, They're allowed to have coaches meetings and film meetings. So I know from a standpoint of like just tactically uh, understanding the game of football, maybe they, when you don't have that chance before because you're so busy training and practicing and, you know, so I think from that standpoint, that may be a benefit, but it is concerning, no doubt. Are you seeing any, anxiety from the players over that and what might happen with the season itself and, and, um, you know, especially from guys who might have a chance to go to the NFL and really need the season to, you know, show what they can do. Um, Yeah, I'm not really sure about, again, about what they're feeling about the future. I think we all are a little bit just because that's the nature of it. I think the anxiety came from, to be honest with you, here they are where they're off to the school, they're on their own, they're growing, they're, they're, you know, in the big boy world, they're doing their stuff. They're now all of a sudden they're back at home and, you know, it was crazy initially. Like I think the first week or two, it was okay. All right. This is, you know, spend some family time. It's cool. And then once they realized like, uh, this is kind of cramping my style a little bit, they were kind of bouncing off the walls. I know, I know for a fact, uh, Justin Fields was, uh, you know, you talk to him, he's like, Coach, I, like I'd call him and FaceTime, and he'd be like walking around in circles in his living room, like, Justin, sit down, relax, man. And then as time has gone on, he's really gotten himself into a routine, and that's what we've, we've uh, preached to our players, you know, during this time. You have to get into a routine. You, have to, you can't stay up all night playing video games. And you can't be all over the place. You have to be in a in a um, – pretty accountable routine of getting up and having breakfast and working out and doing your schoolwork and doing your meetings and just having those things throughout the day. And um, it's almost like as time has gone on, you could see, you could really see and hear the maturity of some guys um, that nine weeks ago or 10 weeks ago, whatever it's been, it, it was like despair almost, you know, an anxious despair of, Oh, what's happening. But it's actually kind of promising, I guess. All right, thanks, Mick. Next, next up is Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch with Austin Ward on deck. Bill? Hi, Mick. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry that your dreams of being a rock and roll drummer on tour probably got dashed <laughs> by the pandemic. Uh, thanks, Bill. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm sure a big part of your job is to be able to, to be right next to your players physically, to be able to look them in the eyes and them to look you in the eye and see that intensity, be able to kind of get over the edge uh, to push it to 11, to use the rock and roll analogy. Uh, you can't do that now. How hard is that for you, and what are you trying to do to try to simulate that somehow? It is by far the most difficult endeavor of my professional coaching career. I, I can't I can't even – you know, obviously there's a lot of other – harsher and difficult things going on in the world right now. Um, so I kind of put it in perspective, but at least in my little world of coaching, it's so hard just because, you know, I think 31 years or 32 years, I've never been away from a weight room more than seven days at a time. And uh, the only time you don't get to see your players is during those breaks. And now all of a sudden you're, you know, zooming and FaceTime and, you know, it's sometimes when you're in that Zoom and you got ten guys in front of you, you just want to reach out and, you know, smack them in the back of the head and mess around with them or give them a hug or whatever, slap them high fives and dap them or, or some some sort of, you know, greeting. But you can't, so it's really hard. But I, but again, I, I look at it as a challenge of growth for a, you know opportunity to grow. And it again, like you have. You start talking about you can see guys growing up, and I use example of Garrett Wilson. 
Um, you know, Garrett Wilson's a young player, a freshman. He don't know, he don't know, and he's really talented. And you know, he had some. He's he's immature, just like all freshmen are. And then just over the nine weeks, you know, we call and now we're on the phone for thirty minutes, and we're talking about training and football. But you 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 you, you kind of get sidetracked, and now you're having a conversation with a eighteen, nineteen year old kid about like Netflix and what shows you're watching and how how all American and you know reminds me of you a little bit and it, it's it's kind of crazy how the how the how the shift has turned a little bit and and how you're communicating with your players but there's no doubt it's been hard um and there's been a lot of talk if the season does go ahead how long it will take to get players ready uh i've heard four weeks six weeks different people have advocated different things what what's your thought on that and what's your biggest concern if and when that process starts in terms of of doing it safely and and keeping players healthy yeah i i think again we've been in we've been in numerous meetings uh regarding that that subject and there's a lot of different papers and guidelines out there that people are putting out there it's real, to be honest with you, it's really hard to tell because we've never had to do this before. Now you could say, well, back in the seventies or division two, II, division three, they, they do this all the time. I get that. But again, when you, when you're used to a product like, you know, division one major college football right now, um, you know, how, how much or how long is it going to take to get people ready to play the game of football? It's, I, I don't, and I think we have an idea. It's just, I don't know if we know that. Um, I know this, the longer we have to prepare them when we're at least in their supervision, I think the better and the safer. Uh, my worry is is if, um, you know, if we don't have those time, if we don't have that time that some people aren't doing it safely and they're trying to, you know, put three pounds of you-know-what into a one-pound bag. Um, so that's my concern, just being – you know, kind of diligent and progressive and safe as we get as we get close. So there's no doubt. I mean, we've had we've had numerous talks with experts and you know medical people and training people and coaching and coaches and everything. So uh, I think they're still kind of working all those out, but we'll see as it gets closer. Is there a type of injury that you're most concerned about when you do ramp up? Um, no, I just I just think. I mean, really anything, because if you're not used to doing something and you ramp up too fast, you just got to do it slow and progressive and got to be smart. And, you know, it's just, again, I just think that, I think that's all the uh, the questions that everybody has and, and uh, the concerns, you know, again, we're, we have some guidelines in place from the, uh, the two organizations that uh, the strength conditioning coaches out there are involved with, the CSCCA and the NSCA. So we have some guidelines in place to, to to have a slow progression. So I think as long as everybody follows those and takes those precautions, that'll help. Thanks, Nick. Yep. Next up, Austin Ward from Letterman Row with Nathan Baird on deck. Austin? Hey, Mick. Thanks for the, your time this morning. Uh, you referenced early on that you know not everybody had full home gyms. Obviously, these are college students and that – You'd sent out some bands, and kids had backpacks that maybe they were using. What's the most uh, unique workout that you've seen so far with, with kids trying to make do with what they've got right now? Yeah, um, we've had a couple. Uh, you know, Matt Jones was right in the he was right in the right in the epicenter in Brooklyn. I mean, he was right there. He had some some really scary stories that he was telling us. You know, we we're calling him, and uh, he couldn't even go outside just because of all the stuff so he actually took two milk jugs and uh, he did go outside because he filled them up with dirt and sand uh and he filled the milk jugs back up so he would use those as dumbbells because he had nothing except the bands that we sent him so he was doing presses and curls and triceps and 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 squats with these uh um milk jugs filled with dirt which was uh, uh kind of creative and then the the coolest thing that we've had um was Jeremy Ruckert again. He's he's uh, he's in New York, right near the, the, you know, the kind of the epicenter where all the bad stuff was around us. But he, uh, him and his dad built a squat rack, and they built a um, uh, basically out of wood, uh, 
um, which is really cool. I mean, and he was so proud of it. So he actually can now he can, you know, lift weights and he had an old bar and old weights and, you know, again, backpacks with rocks in it for doing lunges and, you know, things like that is just as creative as you can be, um, you know, pushing cars and lawnmowers and things like that. Um, whatever they can come up with, to be honest with you. Have you guys all had to keep inventory of who has what? Because I, I, you say you're sending up 30 <laughs> different workouts to kids. I mean, like, how, how challenging has that part of it been for the strength staff here? Yeah, great question. So what we did, um, what we did was we um, um, we have the yeah. five strength we, coaches and we have five groups of like 20, 25 guys. So uh, instead of me checking in on 120 or somebody else, uh, like for example, uh, Quinn Barham has the uh, tight ends and the uh, O linemen, and that's his group. Um, you know, Kenny Parker has the defensive backs and the running backs. Uh, Nico Pelzetti has the wide receivers and the uh, linebackers. And Chris Fenelon has the D linemen um, and the specialists. And I think Quinn had the uh, quarterbacks. And then I have a group of, uh, of, of kind of intermixed group of uh, 16 to 18 guys. And then we, it's easier to keep track. And then uh, the hard part for me has been um, just reaching out to the whole team just to hear from me, whether by text or – a you know, big thing over this COVID crisis has been uh, FaceTime. Everybody FaceTime. Whether FaceTime, no matter where they're at, they're FaceTime. So that's been interesting um, just to see them. But uh, we have two different workouts. We have a, a full equipped workout, meaning they have access to a gym or uh, a weight room in their garage or basement. And then you have a limited equipment, which obviously the bands that we're able to send them, and that they have dumbbells and. I, it just takes constant communication, and we keep a we keep an Excel log of uh, each week of what they've got at home, or you know sometimes people have bought things online, dumbbells or barbells, or they came across things that they're you know was at their high school field in a in, a, in the back pasture somewhere, and then they'll just let us know, and we kind of um, tweak their their program based on what they have. Thanks, Mick. Yep. Next up, Nathan Baird from Cleveland.com with Dan Hope on deck. Nathan? All right, thanks a lot. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the plans you're designing are going to change depending on the athlete, as, as they always do. What right now is the biggest challenge for offensive linemen and what they have to do during this time, just considering the, the bulk and, and some of the, the specified things that they have to have? Great question. So um, um, all of our linemen had access to a um, – no, they didn't. Initially, they all didn't have access to, um, you know, loaded weights uh, or, you know, weight equipment. Um, I'm pleased to tell you right now that at this time we all have – they all have something. So whether it was um, uh, somebody being able to get – uh, to a buddy's house or wherever um, to get um, weight equipment, they have it. And again, like I said, they whether they ordered it from somewhere online, uh, they all have it. So that that's been very um, concerning because you're right; uh, those linemen have to have um, not that you not that you can't get work done. It's just a little bit different because of the bulk and the mass of the guys and uh, how big they are and how much they gotta move and how much they gotta do throughout a game. So right now we're in a good spot. So feel good about those guys. And I guess similarly for those guys, dietary, like how are you communicating with them? Um, Cause that's going to change maybe for them as opposed to other groups too. Yep. Um, our nutritionist Kayla Olson um, is uh, she's probably the busiest, you know, the busiest person of, um, of our staff because she's, you know, she reaches out to what we call our high needs athletes, which are ones that need to gain weight or lose weight or um, lose body fat, increase muscle mass. And it's really hard sometimes to, uh, uh, you know, the availability of food. And, you know, they're used to having food at their fingertips in the woody at all times. And now you go home and people are working and now they may have to make food and make a meal. So it's been a little bit 
uh, a little bit challenging for them. So uh, they do a pretty good job of uh, uh, keeping us up to date of what their what their body weights are. Um, and again, uh, we know that it may not be 100% accurate, but that's part of their routine. So if they get up, you know, we part of our routine for them is make sure you weigh in, make sure you eat breakfast, and kind of go through that that time period. So. You know, we're all crossing our fingers because at some point they're going to be back on campus. Thanks. Next up, Dan Hope from 11 Warriors with Joey Kaufman on deck. Dan? Hey, Mick. Thanks for doing this. Oh, no Would you problem. you be able to give us an example or two of a workout that you, you know, suggest for players who might not have weights at their home? Yeah. Um, again, now, uh, because we are able to, uh, you know, obviously Gene Smith and our administration so graciously um, let us do this. Um, you know, everybody has a bit, so they have three bands. They have a, they have a 75 pound resistant band, a 50 pound resistant band, and then a kind of a 10 pound small band. So, um, you know, if we were to do a uh, upper body workout, it may consist of um, push ups, uh, a bunch of core work. You know whether they're doing a static, um, static core, or you know the old sit-ups and crunches and things like that. Different glute bridging exercises uh, would consist of uh, shoulder press, pulls with the bands wrapped around um, some fixture in your house, so you can do like a rowing, rowing movement. Uh, maybe an overhead. Well, <laughs> like. If you have a pull-up bar or a beam across the basement of your house, you can do pull-ups. Uh, although we had one of our players, Nick Petit, was outside in his house, off the edge of his house, doing pull-ups, and then the gutter fell down, and his mom wasn't too excited about that. So we had to come up with a different plan for him. Uh, but things like that where you're, you're, you're kind of doing body weight exercise and you just use, you just add the band for more resistance, so it's almost like adding weight without, you know, the weight itself. It's just the the the, uh, the resistance of the band and and the uh, and the force that the band has. And when you look at the team, you know, whenever you guys are able to come back together and you have that return to play period, what are the biggest things in your mind that you look at? Or these are the things we're going to have to do in order to make up for lost time and get these guys ready. Yeah, that's, how, that's, that's, that's going to be the challenging thing. The f first thing we're going to do is obviously go through all the testing that we have to do in terms of the COVID and, and all the medical uh, protocols that we have to follow. But once all that stuff is cleared, um, I would love to get um, a, a DEXA scan, which is a measure of uh, lean muscle mass, body fat, if you will. And that will tell us a lot because that's like comparing apples to apples. So we can actually compare back to what they were in March uh, before they left for spring break um, and kind of give us an idea of where they're at physically. Um, and then just, again, you have to be smart and slowly progress. And um, I think that body fat uh, DEXA scan will tell us a lot. And then we can kind of get them in separate groups. Cause you're going to have, again, you know, think about 120 guys, you're going to have, you're almost going to have like four or five subgroups, um, you know, one of the groups being someone that has been over the top, followed everything to a T, they're self-motivated, they're, you know, maybe they're a junior, senior, they, they've been, they play, they know what it takes. And then you got the younger players that maybe don't know what, what exactly what it takes. So, and then you got the medium guys. And we, we made an analogy of the 10-80-10 rule Coach Meyer used to talk about all the time. Um, you know, we're probably like, Right now, we're probably, in my mind, maybe 30, 30, 50, 20. You know, 30% are just probably in the best shape of their life, and then 50% in good shape, and then you got to what's left, 20% um, maybe that has, has fallen behind a little bit. So I think you're going to have to train those athletes when they come back differently because they're going to be in different spots. You can't, you can't have a program based on the top 30% and then have everybody else expect to be keep you know to keep up and that's that's unsafe so we're probably going to have to slow progress one group we're going to have to moderately progress another group and then we can excel another group so yeah it's going to be it's going to be a little challenging i think the more time we have the better but 
I just think that's the approach you got to take. Thanks, Vic. Yeah, no problem. All right, next up is Joey Kaufman with the Columbus Dispatch with Spencer Holbrook on deck. Joey? Hi, hi Mick. I was wondering, you mentioned earlier that D2, D3 programs obviously have a different type of off-season workout regimen. Have you, by chance, talked to anybody at like those levels of football about like what their ramp-up period is like and, and picked anybody's brains from, from, from that level of college football who have like condensed off-season programs? Yep, good question. Actually, I have. Um, we uh, reached out to uh, Division II, uh, some of the former interns that are running the program now, and just exactly how they do it. Um, uh, and, again, I played Division II football, so, again, that was, that was a while back. But, again, you a lot of it is um, – a lot of it, I think, is preached within their programs throughout the year that when the summer comes, you're going to have to be – you're going to have to hold yourself accountable and – um, you know, here's the steps that you have to take to make sure you, um, you know, you're ready to rock and roll when time comes, when you show up for camp. Um, but it, it was interesting because they, um, a lot of it is just the accountability that they hold their program to building up to that summer. So I guess there's expectations of, you know, what the programs are supposed to follow. And it's very similar to what we're doing now. You know, some guys I talked to, um, my one uh, former intern, and he said, Coach, I got guys going away to Spain and and uh, overseas as part of a, a work, you know, work study program or, you know, classes o- abroad. And, you know, we have to send them programs where there's no equipment. And, and, and then, you know, they come back and they're kind of ready to go when, when, when the season starts as best they can. So I think it's all situational of where they're at. Um, but they, it, it's, it's, it's almost exactly what we're going through right now. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously it was a different era, but what was it like when you were a player? Well, you got, you know, when, uh, when you got done with spring football, uh, you had maybe two more weeks to, for academics. Um, you had a couple more, uh, mandatory workouts with the, with the, uh, strength coach and the, um, uh, and the coaches, and then when you went home for the summer, because everybody, nobody stayed, um, no one was there for the summer classes, you went home, you worked a job, you were given a program that was mapped out every day what you're supposed to do. You were going to be testing when you got back, a uh, physical test of a um, gasser test or mild test and, you know, strength testing, bench press, squat, and those type things. And I think that the guys that were m- most prepared – got the first shot um, on the field just because they put in the work and time. Um, and then you just kind of, you know, went, went about your way with the season. Thanks. Welcome. All right. All right. Next up is Spencer Holbrook from Letterman Row with Bill Landis on deck. Spencer. Hey, Mick. Uh, when you guys talk about the brotherhood and the culture, a lot of that happens in the weight room and, and not being able to be in there, I'm sure is having an effect on that. Do you think that it could have like the opposite effect of what a lot of people think it could and bring these guys closer together because they can't be around each other as much this year? Yes, wholeheartedly, no doubt. And I think that's what's happening right now. Again, um, it's funny. I've got just out of the blue, usually it's, it's, it's the strength coaches or me, like, you know, calling guys or I don't want to say chasing them around, but, you know, texting them and they don't text back. And then I'm texting, you know, why don't you text me back? You know, one of those deals. Um, and I got a couple calls from some players and uh, they made mention of, you know, they were wherever they were at, where there were other players um, around and they're so proud and so caught by how hard, they work compared to what others were doing. And I think those messages permeated throughout the team. So that word, there's a sense of pride, you know, again, what they, what they've done and what they go through on a day-to-day basis. And I think our program, just uh, the foundation that it's built. And I do think, I do, I really do think that um, it's a test of their character when they're away from their teammates but again, like you're looking at your teammates on the Zoom and you see their faces, and you don't want to let them down. And we've talked a lot uh, leadership, 
throughout these times. We've had, um, um, you know, guest speakers that would talk about their experiences when they played and, you know, the challenges that they're, that's, a, that's in front of their face and just, I don't know, it's just, again, I think a lot of it has to do with the residual from the team we had last year. So many players, you know, the Wyatt Davises and the Josh Myers and the Thayer Mumfords and, you know, Chris Olave, and, you know, Justin Fields and just all the guys, all the tight ends. I mean, they've been here forever. Uh, and then the guys on defense. And I just think, like, those guys are really doing a good job of challenging their teammates, um, you know, kind of holding them accountable from afar. Uh, so that's – I agree. I think – I do think – I think they're going to get – I think they're going to get close. I really do. Thanks, Mike. Welcome. All right, next up is Bill Landis from The Athletic with Tim May on deck. Bill. Thanks. Hey, Mick. Um, I'm I'm wondering, as as your guys are going through this time, is the majority of what they're doing just sort of maintaining where they were when spring practice was abruptly ended, or have there been guys who have made some strides here that maybe were a bit unexpected and have surprised you? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. I think, again, because it's – I don't want to say it's it's up it's it's really what their circumstance is, but it's it's really hard to make physical gains uh, if you you know as if you were in the in the weight program in the Woody and you know you're getting evaluated and pushed and trained and you know challenged every day. We're just doing it a different way, um, but I just think you know it. I think guys can make 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 really good gains and. From what they tell us, in terms of a, a very general sense, uh, because they're really not allowed to report back the objective stuff, like they, they feel like they are. Like again, maybe it's belief, but that's okay. I mean, they they really feel like um, you know, especially guys that have that in that position of studying the game of football, whether it's the offensive line. You know, they've watched so much film. I just think they feel like they're in a better spot because they're really looking at their technique and breaking it down. And I know it's hard because you can't go right on the field and practice those techniques. And I just think they're really breaking down the things that they didn't have time to do. And then from a physical standpoint, I think the younger the player, the more ceiling they have to improve. And if they're in the right mindset and they're, um, you know, they got that, they got that chip on their shoulder to prove something. I think they're going to make they're, they're going to make gains. Um, I really do, and I think the more we hold each other accountable from a team standpoint, from a coaching staff standpoint, from a player to player standpoint, unit to unit, I just think it'll it'll carry us at least through this through this time. And uh, I know that your job and your staff's job, obviously, is to, is to get this team and these players ready for for what's hopefully a season coming, but. I also imagine that you guys like to throw the weights around yourselves and, and, and get and get a, a good workout. <laughs> staff. Like, what's the setup at the Marathi house, and, and how have you been able to, to, I don't know, find some semblance of normalcy in your own fitness routine? Yeah, so the Marathi house has um, uh, now they're, – they're now fully stocked with bicycles. So we go on road race with my son. We go all the time. Um, we have uh, kettlebells and bands and dumbbells in the basement and every day I'm down there doing something. Um, I do the elliptical every day for a minimum of an hour. I've read within that hour, I've read probably 11 books. I haven't read a book in 25 years from cover to cover. I think I read 11 already while I'm on the elliptical. Uh, My whole family, my wife, my daughter, my son, we all walk and we try to beat each other's steps. Um, as much as we can, so yeah, we're we're pretty busy um, in and out of you know dealing with players and talking to um, you know talking to our staff and things like that. So yeah, that's been that's been fun. What's been the best thing you've read on your elliptical reads? Um, good question. One, the one I do like is um, uh, "Pound the Stone" by Joshua Metcalf. I don't know if you guys have read it. Um, it's uh, it's about kind of, you know, taking the process and just, you know, just let the process take care of, of itself. A lot of different messages. 
he had a book before it was called uh, uh, Chop Wood, Carry Water. Same thing, like a story, a bunch of stories, I, and back to history, and I kind of love that stuff. I love history. So a uh, good message of uh, just uh, embracing the process, um, whether it's business or athletics, but those those have been pretty, two pretty good ones. Thanks, Mike. Welcome. All right, next up is Tim May from Letterman Row with Patrick Murphy on deck. Go for it, Tim. All right. No Tim May. Uh, Patrick, uh, this would be the last questioner of the call. Patrick Murphy from 247 Sports. Go for it. Hey, Mick, thanks for doing this. Um, you talked about the, the leaders, and Coach Day talked about that in January and needing new guys to step up. I'm curious with your experience with them in the winter and then the beginning of spring practice, if you could give us a few guys you saw emerging in those roles and how they were doing that. Yes, that's a great question. We actually, um, I don't want to say put them on the spot, but again, um, there has to be opportunities for growth uh, in leadership. So we actually put our our players in front of our team um, for them to, the hardest thing is to speak in front of the team. And we had, you know, we do mat drills and during mat drills, before the, each, match drill, each mat drill, we had players come up and talk to our team about a message and uh, we came up with a couple messages, you know, um, and they had to talk about it and not to get the team fired up, but just a message to the team. And uh, probably, again, I've been doing it so long, and I think everybody will attest to the fact that the one guy that stood out to me was Wyatt Davis. He gave probably the most inspiring uh, talk to a team in a winter program that I've ever heard in my life. It was I mean, it, it, I had tears. I know a lot of other guys were, were teared up, and just it, it, it meant so much. And it was it wasn't more it wasn't more about a message as it as it was about the process of his development through his time in Ohio State because he was highly touted, wasn't ready, had to go through that adversity, uh, was at rock bottom, and had to work his way up, and got a break. And it's funny he talked about uh, when when uh, Demetrius Knox got hurt in the uh, team up North game. And he was playing in a big 10 uh, championship first time starter. And it wasn't, he, he didn't, he said, it wasn't about, I finally get my shot. This is all about me. I can't, now I can prove myself. He said, I didn't want to let everybody down. I didn't want to let my unit down. I didn't want to let the team down because this team meant so much. And um, that was his first two games. He started that in the Rose bowl. And then obviously what he did last year, but he said, he goes, the one thing he did say was, you know, I never understood or, or I, I, I didn't fully understand the process of how we train and develop our players at Ohio State until I actually played the game and actually played this season because sometimes it's hard and grueling and as challenging as it is, you don't know that it's actually – you know, training the mental and the emotional part of it as well as the physical. And until he got in a game where you're, you know, 80, 85 snaps and you got to play from the first snap to the last snap um, as hard as you possibly can, then he finally realized. And Josh Myers was, was there, said the same exact thing. So that was really cool for me and really cool for our team to see that and our coaching staff to really see the, the growth and development from a leadership standpoint of just, couple of those guys so and there were there was more thanks for watching subscribe below to get the latest videos from letterman row we got letterman live we've got the practice report we got rapid reaction hey and you know we got buck iq with zach Bourne. for sure we got recruiting breakdowns with berm we got whatever you need ohio state football and ohio state athletics we've got you covered here at letterman row